I'm pleased to introduce Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres. He is in the Department of Latino, Hispanic, and Caribbean Studies at Rutgers University. He'll be chairing uh, and, moder and moderating the final panel discussion on human rights, democracy, and the right to development. Professor Maldonado Torres has published several books, including against one on a titled Against War and a second on decolonialization and the decolonial turn, which examines the work of a variety of intellectuals from all over the world. Professor Maldonado. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by thanking Professor uh, Radhika Balakrishnan for committing herself um, to have a native Puerto Rican among the participants today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we from the colonies count. <laughs> My name is Nelson Maldonado Torres, and I am the, as it was said, the chair of the Latino and Hispanic Caribbean Studies Department, and a member of the core faculty in the program in comparative literature. Um, I wanted to say a few words as a way of prefacing the, the, the panel, beginning with the fact that uh, next week, the Department of uh, Latino and Hispanic Caribbean Studies which actually was originated as with the name of program and then Department of Puerto Rican Studies. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it came out uh, because of the activism of students, Equal Opportunity Fund students, who pressed the university to open that space. And we're having our 40th anniversary uh, next week. Thank you. And in line, in line with, the, with the Vienna Declaration, I would like to suggest that we see not only the access to education as a human right, but also a transformation in the content of such an education as well. Uh, oftentimes, when it comes to education, human rights are seen as questions of access to an already uh, created structure but it is also a question of having the adequate support and opportunities to contribute to knowledge production and help to effectively transform the research methods, teachings, and pedagogical practices that continue to promote social, institutional, and epistemological exclusion. In that sense, we may want to speak of epistemological rights, and if there are such, then what happened here 40 years ago when a group of young African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and allies made a mark by creating several spaces because African studies also came, uh, emerged in a similar time through a similar upsurge and organization of students, that we may um, want to. Uh, to see that as a fight not only for access, but for the assertion of epistemological rights. And therefore, that includes the recognition um, for um, the kind of support that those programs need to be able to um, exercise their mission and vision of transformation. They, these students did not, saw, did not seek just to be included uh, in the university, inclusion and access sometimes hide expectations of unilateral assimilation into a way of thinking and being, uh, but rather empower so that they could contribute to the formation of knowledge that would foment human rights for all. In that sense, I am particularly happy to be here today um, in this panel of human rights and demonstrate that uh, kind of support and affiliation coming from the department with such a history. Uh, this morning, Professor Radhika Balajkrishnan spoke about the need to consider the ideas, action, forms of organizations of the Global South uh, seriously in our struggle to define or redefine our commitment with human rights. And I think that we have seen a wonderful demonstration of that today in the panel, but also on the floor, as with the eloquent uh, intervention uh, uh, before in the last panel. Uh, and this panel, I don't think, is an exception. 
The panel is titled Human Rights, Democracy, and Right to Development. And since my background is in philosophy, I wanted to put a few philosophical questions at the, uh, at the beginning of it. Particularly the kind of ontological questions that obsess me uh, in the form of what is X? And that I am sure that this panel will help us um, think through, even though they may not explicitly explore them in ontological terms. Uh, and so since the panel is on human rights, democracy, and right to development, I just want to present three basic sort of questions quickly. One, of course, and in a way this is the concluding panel, so these questions in a way go to the found, some of the foundations, that is to the beginning, trying to bring us full circle. What are human rights and what is the human? The question, this question or this question became central in Latin American and Caribbean theorizing in the same period of the Vienna Declaration as intellectuals faced the crisis of critical discourse from the left after the end of the Cold War and the commemoration of the 500 years um, of the so-called discovery of the Americas and the formation of the so-called New World. By New World, many of these intellectuals understood and understand not only what we call the Americas today, the so-called discovered New World, but rather the New World order that unfolded since then through the massive colonization of space and time through European uh, colonial ventures. The Japanese scholar Osamu Nishitani argues that the new, that new World order uh, that we have seen uh, sort of unfold uh, in the last 500 years, inaugurates a conception of the human as well as of humanities, which claims the independence of humanitas from divinitas, of man from God, but at the same time creates a constitutive image of the non-human or not fully human as anthropos. So there are multiple ways of establishing a human difference. And when we talk about the human, for instance, human rights, the question is always what kind of human we have in mind and whether that human in human rights is presupposing also another image of the human as anthropos that is not covered, is never fully covered by those rights. There are, and I think the Vienna Declaration did an advancement in sort of thematizing uh, more carefully the kind of rights to include, to make sure that multiple forms of characteristics, some of them attributed to anthropos, were included. But at the same time, it's clear that um, there are multiple ways of establishing human differences, uh, and something's way beyond gender, race, language, religion, ethnicity, sex, and so on. And um, because they are very minute. And some of these ways of constructing human difference along the humanitas anthropos line are not adequately, do not adequately map into these categories. And they tend to happen to be multiplied and to sustain categories of oppression, even though it's difficult to create a counter to them by naming human rights or specifying what kind of rights we're talking about. And I have an example where I will jump that uh, to give more time to the panelists. The second question is, if the first one is what, human, what is the human, what, is, what are human rights, the second one is democracy. Right? What is democracy? And is there only one form of democracy when we speak about democracy? Right? Uh, and can anthropos achieve democracy? Right? Or do anthropos need first to become like humanitas in order to claim uh, democracy? And third, since the third concept is development, what is development? And doesn't development presuppose an amount of underdevelopment somewhere, just like humanitas has always presupposed anthropos somewhere. Right? So to that extent also the human and development are already, already embedded in sort of a chain of significations that always already presuppose the system of underdevelopment and the, system, the systems of anthropos. Um, and so, of course, the question is what happens when you're still using those concepts when they are embedded in those chains, right? And what is the epistemological upheaval necessary in order for us to really delink ourselves from those chains? It, does human rights discourse provide enough resources for that? Yes, no, and if no, then how can we make it be more part of that sort of delinking, uh, as Walter Mignolo puts it, or that kind of... Uh, uh, insurgency. Um, so, shouldn't we talk of sustainability instead? Does that even help instead of development? Presupposing as a set telos of humanity that everyone should aspire, that is a right. Is the right development or is the right sustainability? And if sustainability 
would sustainability be a right or an imperative or a political and economical necessity or more than one? Anyway, those are the questions with which I enter in the panel. And I'm sure, I, I mean, I'm really convinced that I, I um, will have some clues to address them by your panelists. Uh, so I want to then um, introduce the three of them in the order in which they will speak. The first one is Norma Maldonado. Uh, Norma Maldonado is the founder of the association Rashush Ochla Huach, and I'm sure that I did not pronounce right, even though she helped me to practice. Uh, it is a Tierra Verde or Green Land, right? Green Land Association. Uh, it's an organization of 12 communities of Maya, Quechich, of Northern Guatemala. Uh, Maldonado has been an activist all her life and was also founder of the integration of indigenous Mayas uh, in Los Angeles. She is an environmentalist and a native of Guatemala with a specialty in food sovereignty and indigenous territories. She studied at the University of California in, in Los Angeles and graduated with a bachelor degree in Latin American studies and public health studies and lives in the United States as a refugee. Maldonado has also an ABD in history from the University of Havana and studied permaculture in Brazil and Guatemala. She has engaged in resisting neoliberal policies and creating alternatives since the year 2000. Our second speaker, and they will speak in a row, um, is Naura Erakat from Temple University Beasley School of Law. Uh, Naura, Naura Erakat is a human rights attorney and activist. She teaches international human rights law in the Middle East at Georgetown University and is currently a Abraham L. Friedman teaching fellow at Temple, at Temple Bethley School of Law. Most recently, she served as the legal ad advocacy coordinator for the Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Refugee and Resident Rights. Erakat also serves as legal counsel for the Congressional Subcommittee in the House of Representatives. Her publications have appeared in The Nation, The Hill, Foreign Policy, Al Haram English, Fair Observer, Al Shabaka, The Interdependent International, Int Law Girls, The Huntington Post, Al Jazeera, and Jadalia. She has published several scholarly articles and book chapters, including New Imminence in the Time of Obama, The Impact of Targeted Killings on the Law of Self-Defense, forthcoming in the Arizona Law Review. Erakat is a co-editor of Yadalilla, an electronic publication on the Middle East. Uh, it's always fascinating to have truly um, international uh, sort of panels that by all those very concepts just cry the sort of incompleteness and in a way, in, a, in, in a inadequacy of, of our education, in this case, mine, by not knowing some of these languages. Um, Atieno uh, Enodo Enomo from the United Nations Millennium Campaign. Atieno Endomo is passionate about social justice and equity and has applied skills gained from her professional training in social policy and social development to work towards ensuring lives of dignity, especially for the poor and marginalized sections of society. Over the past 15 years, Endomo has conceptualized and coordinated policy and legislative advocacy and campaigning initiatives for social justice and equity at international, regional, and national levels at the, at the UN Millennium Campaigns Regional Coordinator for Africa. Indomo presently supports the Millennium Campaigns advocacy and campaigning strategies for the acceleration of efforts to achieve the Millennium Development Goals by 2015 and influencing the post-2015 development, development framework Please join me in welcoming them to Rogers and to this panel. Yes. Yo, yo. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. My name is Norma Maldonado. I salute you in Maya Kekchi language too. Um, I'm going to have a very hard time here, I think, today, because it's a real challenge to have to put in 10 minutes or 12, 15, 15, <laughs> 15. Um, sometime, something that I, I, I usually take at least two hours or half a day. Um, I'm really glad, though, to see all these young faces, as you can tell here. Um, 
I'm an oldest activist maybe in this table. And so, and I'm also kind of like running down uh, and in many ways. I also have a cold. And so I'm really trying to make my, my best and I'm really ready to pass this staff to you, the younger generation. So I'm really glad that you stay in the back there, especially. And I hope you learned something. I'm gonna try to share some of the things that we do back home, but also uh, mention some comments about what I heard this morning, especially I can't, I can't take out of my mind that image of the woman whose, whose son is in prison and she was put back into prison because she couldn't gather the money to pay in this privatized prison system in the United States, mm -hmm. a money-making uh, business. And it's very unfortunate. I can't forget that vision of that woman. So to do that, <clears throat> and kind of tie this to, to our experience back home, I, I want to do some deconstruction of some of the wording too, especially the language and what uh, Professor Maldonado mentioned too, to kind of like give an idea what uh, development, right to development. If you see the screen, I asked it to put some, some of the images that I have uh, from my work in Guatemala. And development for who? Because we were never asked uh, that we want to be developed. We never in the South wanted to be like here with so many people in prison. I know there are more people in prison in the United States than in un universities. So saying that, I want to show you uh, a map to de deconstruct that and deconstruct some of the other issues that uh, we've been discussing all day today. And for that, I have a good map of wh where we come from and the Mesoamerican area. Are you familiar with Guatemala, some of you? All of you? Yes? We have a cosmovision and we are different. We, we have a Maya culture. We're 13 million people and 23 languages. And we have technology. Although the colonizer told us that they were gonna come and give us technology because we were backwarded and because we are underdeveloped, and because we don't ha know how to do plant the soil or do our own lives. We have traded forever. We have traded within the Maya sphere for hundreds of years, so we know trade is. And especially, I'm gonna stop on this map it's, it's for many reasons, and I hope Somebody, I was asking for a, for a laser pen because I wanted, to, uh, anybody has a laser pen? No? Okay, I'm gonna stand up then. Um, if you see the, the, red, the red areas in the map, this is a tropical map, uh, map of the tropics made by the, the, the German, I think, because this is in some language. And at the bottom it says, the red box, it says 5,000. So, and at the top, it's uh, the, the box, green box, it says 200. So that means the species per square kilometer. So my question for you now, in Mesoamerica, in Guatemala, we have 5,000 species per square kilometer, and in entire Europe and the United States, you have 200 species per square kilometer. So the question here is, who are the rich countries? <laughs> who are the rich countries? Okay, we are the rich countries and we are impoverished. This is another thing, we have to change that. We're not the poor countries. We're the impoverished countries. So that's number two now. We don't wanna be developed because we don't wanna be in prisons or eating junk food, for that matter. I tell you, in, in, in the airport, that's my first thing, my first experience when I was coming here. The security guards took my medicine because it didn't have a brand. It was a homemade medicine for my throat. 
And it says, you don't have a prescription. Yeah, I say, no, because I made it myself from plants. And it was taken, it was confiscated. And I tell you, inside that airport, there was nothing healthy for my throat, nothing. Including the air conditioning was so unhealthy. That's what I got worse. So, so now that I show you the map and, I, and you see who are the rich countries, we can tell you why we have all these new rules, including the UN with their new rules of governance. OK, I have the tool now. <laughs> here's, here's the rich countries consuming the richness of the entire planet. All that is energy consumed. Northern Hemisphere, Europe, and the United States. And of course, they go for more, so they're looking for our water. So how do, we, how do we get our water here? With electricity. How do you get that? With hydroelectrics. How do you go there? Send all these companies and dry out our, our entire families and communities because the water is on high demand. See, all the water that we're drinking here is privatized. We got water from bottles. Uh, in the hotel, they're $3 a bottle. It's like so, what somebody makes in a day back home for a bottle of water. So I think this panel and all this, this morning is to make all these connections, please. Because I feel, you know, I was feeling almost an anxiety for all these issues and, not be, and we not being able to make the connections yet. And we down, down there, we're really working hard and struggling and putting our lives online daily. We've been sent to prison. We've sent to, our house have been raided. I have lost computers for the, for the uh, government. And the other thing is poverty now is, it's, it's called a new word. And that's another language thing. We're the new terrorists. We're terrorists because we defend seeds, because we defend the rivers, because we defend water. So that language has changed too. We are a threat to the establishment, a threat to the model, because we're so rich. And I, I show you these maps. This is where all the trade agreements by the European Union, exactly if you see the maps, that's where all the wealth is. So it's not a coincidence. It's well planned. Europe is in crisis. So they're looking for our wealth. Where's the wealth? In those nations. So of course they're going to change the rules to their advantage. And whatever they will take. And I have, I can't, I can let uh, Lucy please pass all the rest of the pictures because I'm going to be speaking from my computer. But also, the one more issue here, the militarization. My friend here from Palestina and I was talking to her. I don't know what's worse, believe me, and I'm really tired sometimes, to live so close to the United States or be a Palestinian in an occupied territory. My heart goes always for the Palestinians and for the Kurdish with no country. And we're so far away, we, and we share so many issues together. So militarization, wherever is wealth is militarization. They want our wealth. And of course, they're going to tell us 2015 and so on and so forth. And we go and legitimize, and Bill Gates opened the ceremony for there, and nobody can touch him. And he's launching the second green revolution in Africa. So they can tie the seeds to the people. They sell seeds like Monsanto. In fact, in Colombia, I was in Colombia recently. We don't call it San, uh, Monsantos. It's called now Monsantos, because Santos is Santos is the name of the president. So it's Monsantos loves this. And you know why food is such an issue? Because whoever controls the stomach controls the wheel. We're going to be begging for food if we are starving. But if we produce our food, we're sovereign. So we work on 
seeds and issues of seed making, of seed production. We have banks of seed and we are constructing water cisterns so we collect rainwater so we don't abandon our territories for these companies. So we are fighting back daily. Okay, I have another map here, and that's a map of Guatemala with all the mining companies. It looks like you have a chicken pox there, but those are exploration licenses. Wherever there's water, that's where the mining companies are, because mining requires lots of water. And another thing is gold is an, another issue. So please take off all that gold that you have today and start giving it back and make a big event. Oh, five minutes. So, the gold is an issue for us, and we're, they're destroying our environment in order to take gold, to send it here, and the water, and the electricity, and the oil, and we are confronting with the militarism. And so, I have lots of pictures to show you, but I, I want to start, I'm going to read something that I wrote in my presentation. And I'm sorry, I couldn't, they told me not to show pictures, but I, could, I work with illiterate women. I cannot work without images. I'm a visual person too, so I need to see. So I'm gonna read now something that I have written for the presentation. And you can still, you can still watch the images, please. Um, I like the other mic better. <laughs> <clears throat> Ah, the computer's off. Um, during 1954, Guatemala was occupied by the CIA and had a coup d'etat. Because of what? Because of Anana Company, owned by, by the Douglas brothers. And so we have a coup d'etat and we were imposed a military dictatorship. So I, I was born under that dictatorship. So I had had not one day of peace in my life, not one. So thanks to these companies, so this is nothing new. Now the, the, the division of the world is coming with the trade agreements and with what my friend Hibumika was talking here with the, uh, with the WTO. Those trade agreements are WTO plus. So whatever we didn't gain on the WTO, Co negotiations is being dealt under trade agreements. So by law, with supranational laws, all these companies are going there and getting whatever they need to compete in the world. So we can be developed, they say. And guess what? Guatemala produces food. It's a center origin of its species. And we're the most malnourished country in the hemisphere. We send broccoli to this country. We're the first producer of cardamom in the world. We're the fourth producer of sugar in the world, tiny country. So I wanna make these connections always because we can continue with this. When I come to the United States, because I study here and I love it here too, I get sad if I don't see the improvement uh, and the connections. And I don't blame you, there's so many issues here. And you're overwhelmed with the news and the, the CNN and the wars and inventing another war in Syria and inventing another enemy here and there. And so overwhelming, but overwhelming for us down there too. Believe me, tiring. So we have internal conflict since the 80s. We sent all these youth to live in the United States. They were persecuted like animals and the border, the migrants. I work with the migrants here in LA and people had no rights whatsoever. Not even right to have a name of their own because they have to invent names for the social security. And some, some states don't even allow them for a license to, so they can work. So the same, same recipe they're sending down in our countries, privatization of things. 
So they're flashing me minutes here. I, I told you I could talk for half an hour, half a day. Um, I'm really glad, though, because my throat is getting worse. But <laughs> I'd be happy to take any questions, and we can discuss outside before I take a plane anytime. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Center for Organizing This, for Rutgers University, for uh, Norma, for very, very touching solidarity that's actually been not just from her, but everyone's solidarity with one another, but especially this question of what's worse, to live closer in such proximity to the U.S. or under Israeli military occupation? Well, as everyone's been saying, there's not much difference. There's not much difference. So. Um, I will also draw connections uh, from the previous panel on neoliberalism and discuss these contested definitions of democracy and development, but for the sake of time and to make this young woman's life easier, I'm going to read uh, my lecture. In mid-December 2010, a young street vendor set himself on fire after his ill treatment by Tunisian police. Mohamed Bouazizi set himself ablaze in Sidi Bouzid and inspired an entire region to revolt against decades of authoritarianism. Mass protests in Tunisia led to the ouster of his autocratic head of state, Zin Abidin Ben Ali, and this revolutionary fervor then spread to neighboring Egypt, where 18 days of protest removed Hosni Mbarak from the helm of power. Soon, these tectonic shifts inspired protesters in Yemen, Libya, Bahrain, and Syria to challenge their autocratic leaders who had for decades on end also denied them the right to freely determine their political, economic, and social conditions. The protests have since successfully led to the negotiated removal of Yemen's Ali Abdullah Saleh from power NATO military intervention, initially mandated by the UN Security Council to thwart a massacre in Benghazi, expanded into a mission of regime change and ended the rule of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. Today, protests continue, and an imminent US strike against Syria has been thwarted. But protests continue there in Syria, in Bahrain, and the transition process has never ceased in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Yemen. The emergence of authoritarian regimes in the Arab world reflects a sordid history of colonial rule and post-colonial interventions that have created oppositional politics among states within the Middle East. We, the Middle East, is also rich in natural resources like gas and oil and has been one of the most penetrated region by foreign interests as gruesomely demonstrated by the 2003 Iraq War. Arab governments, mostly, became authoritarian after their decolonization from French and British rule following the Second World War and well after. The Palestinians, Palestine has not been amongst those to be liberated. The authoritarian regimes created, uh, cultivated popular legitimacy by combining authoritarianism with a re redistributive welfare state a state in what political scientists refer to as authoritarian populism. Despite significant opposition, most Arab populations welcome these, this social contract. In exchange for political and civil rights, regimes would provide economic stability in the form of basic goods like subsidized food and housing, as well as the security to live free of internecine violence. This social contract, however, quickly began to unravel. GDP growth rates generally rose, that generally rose with the beginning of populist policies and the uh, public sector expansion began to quickly fall in the 1980s as a result of a combination of repression, corruption, and mismanagement. As Arab authoritarian regimes have entered into the globalized economy through neoliberal prescriptions, they began to privatize public goods like water, electricity, housing, and education through PPPs. By steadily retracting redistributive policies, 
whilst maintaining authoritarian governance, Arab authoritarian populists breached their tenuous social contracts. By the 2000s, as the gap between rich and poor expanded, and as gender and other social-based disparities deepened within Arab countries, their aggregate economic figures oddly improved, but at the dire expense of equitable distribution. The IMF, for example, in 2010, praised Tunisia's, quote, sound policies and reforms for helping the country weather the global downturn. The inverse relationship between aggregate and socioeconomic development is not unique to the Arab world. In fact, its ubiquitous character, among developing states especially, reflects the principles first captured in the 1986 UN Declaration of the Right to Development and later affirmed by the 1993 Vienna World Conference on Human Rights. The missing ingredient has been distributive equity. Drafters of the UN Declaration on the Right to Development were careful not to reduce development to purely economic aspirations. Instead, the document reflects a textured understanding of human and national development. It affirms the independence of development, uh, the interdependence of development, democracy, and human rights. It suggests that in order to benefit from development, human persons must be free from structural abuse so as to freely participate in their cultural, economic, social, and political development. In 1993, the Vienna Declaration reaffirmed development as a human right, as well as the interconnectedness of this trinity. It emphasizes that democratization in this context is, quote, based on the freely expressed will of the people to determine their own political, economic, social, and cultural systems and their full participation in all aspects of their life. In marked contrast, neoliberal prescriptions define democratization in pursuit of development as opening up of the market without regard to human rights or human agency. Its over-reliance on trickle-down effects casts the state as an obtrusion to prosperity. Worse, policymakers who aim to dismantle state regulation and control of natural resources took for granted how neoliberal prescriptions globally overlapped with the interests of local economic and political elite. The effect was a redistribution of state wealth and opportunities to a new elite class of public and private actors without regard for equitable distribution of opportunities and resources. Democratization and participation therefore remained exclusionary in content and structure. This development program in the Middle East, characterized by auto uh, autocratic governance and marked by economic stagnation, has been intensely undemocratic and brutally indifferent to the dignity of individual persons and their collective formations. Rather than consider the state's failure to empower, to include, and to provide adherents of neoliberal development, frame the Arab uprisings as a revolt against government bureaucracy and rent-seeking. While there may be truth in that, by delinking the gains of national economic and political elite from an international neoliberal development project, Stakeholder states and IFIs mistakenly exculpate themselves. Fittingly, Robert Zolik, president of the World Bank, attributed Bouazizi's self-immolation with his frustration with red tape. <coughs> Zolik advised that Arab states should, quote, quit harassing people and let them have a chance to start small businesses. However, at the time of its uprising, Egypt ranked as the 80th easiest state in which to start a small business. Either the irony of the, of the dispositive evidence was missed on Zolik, either the irony or the dispositive evidence was missed on Zolik. Myopic focus on institutional governance fails to scrutinize the privileged access to economic opportunities in developing states that thwarts development, democracy, and human rights. Over the course of three decades of authoritarian rule, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, comprised of Mubarak himself com together with its incumbent economic and political elite, amassed a tremendous amount of the country's wealth for their own personal benefit. The state acquired 35 billion US dollars in loans. 
85% of which is publicly guaranteed, and none of which benefits the general population. In the course of repaying its loans, more loans flow from Egypt to the West than the other way around. And since the ouster of Mubarak, no attention has been given to remedying this condition. To the contrary, from the, de from the democratically elected Muslim Brotherhood, and now within the military regime that's ousted it, these neoliberal policies have become even more entrenched. States and IFIs pledged 15 billion US dollars to post Mubarak Egypt within three months of his ouster, of course, uh, premised on a profound liberalization of the Egyptian economy. Syria stands out as an exception amongst its Arab neighbors only for resisting similar development, a similar development shift until the late 1980s. In 1986, the Syrian regime shifted its social and political alliances from labor to business. In a context of economic stagnation, the shift also marked a slow but gradual reduction in state subsidies for basic goods, upon which a significant cross-section of the Syrian population was reliant. By the 2000s, combined with the deleterious effect of policies driven by a new business class with ties to the government, this resulted in greater absolute poverty and social polarization, as well as a dramatic increase of the informal sector. All the while, the Syrian regime steered this shift in the name of investment, growth, and modernity. Together with the most severe drought that has caused the forced internal migration of more than 1.2 million Syrians since 2003, social polarization and discontent reached extraordinary levels by the 2000s, tipping the balance in favor of a mass-based uprising in rural areas. While this may explain the origin of the conflict, it hardly explains how the uprising has turned into an internal conflict or civil war and how it's become a gruesome regional proxy war. And I won't discuss that because that's not the point of my conversation. Um, but I'm happy to answer those questions. So I don't mean to suggest that the failure to adhere to, in, to the interdependent development approach as suggested by the UN uh, Human Rights uh, right the UN Convention on the Right to Development or the Vienna Declaration Human Rights Program, um, that that's cause, that that's the reason there's be, uh, been uh, mass mobilization across the Arab world, that would be rather simplistic. The anecdotal case studies, however, do illustrate the gravity and enduring relevance of human-centered development. They also show how other states and international institutions are implicated in these national struggles. Both lessons are instructive for practitioners, organizations, and analysts concerned with development, democracy, and human rights in the Arab world. I'll, because of the limited time, I'll just share my prescription for the human rights community, which happens to be uh, better represented here today than other communities. But these case studies are a stern reminder of the inextricability of civil, political, and social, and economic rights. It's much simpler and much easier to attribute the upheaval in the Arab world to a lack of democratic governance, to a lack of free and fair elections, to a lack of an independent judiciary, and a lack of police accountability. However, it would be quite short-sighted to extricate these coercive measures from an international economic system that precludes democratic participation with equity and is conditioned upon a truncated state. Of under these terms, development must occur in spite of popular will rather than on its behalf. It is telling that after Ben Ali's ouster from Tunisia, Tunisians opted to loot luxury villas, shops, and supermarkets identified as belonging to the royal family rather than attack police stations. Human rights practitioners and organizations should bear in mind that expansion of political and civil, civil participation for individuals within government must be interlinked with more meaningful economic self-determination, which is also rooted in industrialized societies where these policies are being promulgated and, and legislated. And so without going to further detail about debt forgiveness, and about um, how much of this human rights advocacy we'd like to see for those people over there, that much of that work has to happen over here. 
And these prescriptions are obviously not new. They've been reiterated time and again. We're reiterating them here uh, very clearly throughout the day. And I'll close by sharing that self-determination of individuals, collectivities, and states cannot be over uh, estimated and alleviating these conditions that we abhor and making central the uh, person and society, not just the person herself. Human rights advocacy should take its cue from those local and regional movements that are viscerally, viscerally and daily affirming this principle. Thank you. I feel like I have, uh, let me get this close. I feel as though I have the misfortune of speaking last um, of today that's been quite engaging and interesting. So I also run the risk of saying things that have been said before, perhaps much more eloquently. Um, but if I do that, then I think it's perhaps that we emphasize uh, points that are really crucial. Um, I don't think, I might not even take the 15 minutes, but let's see how I do. Uh, firstly, just to say a big thank you to Radhika for the invite and also the center. I, I am quite happy to be a part of this conversation and what seems like a really interesting community uh, to be a part of. Um, I also wanted to say that um, the topic that I, I am going to speak to, I engage the post-2015 discussion from the point of view that it is a sphere where we can wield influence. So I don't come to it from the point of view that it's a fait accompli or that we cannot make a difference to it. Uh, I'm an activist and so I'm perpetually optimistic mm -hmm. about the change we can uh, make happen. So if we choose to make change happen, then we can do so, even if it takes long or even if it seems like we're hitting our head on a wall. So I come to that discussion that we can propagate it even with alternative ideas, even if those ideas don't win now, but that we can use that sphere to challenge uh, dogmatic ideas and to suggest that there are alternatives that perhaps would work better. Um, having said that as well, I come from the UN Millennium Campaign, which is a very small entity, but we are a campaigning organization. So as an activist, I feel that I fit there quite well, and we work in partnership with the citizens and their organizations to try and hold the development process to account in that sense. So I hope that helps uh, put in context some of what I will share. I titled my presentation, uh, so post 2015, Towards an Agenda for Structural Transformation and a Rights-Based, Just, Accountable, and Sustainable Paradigm of Development. It's loaded with very many words, and they may sound like words or jargon, but each one of those words for me are very profound and hold a lot of meaning, and I think people around the room perhaps relate to that. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, the post-2015 development agenda, in my view, will only be meaningful if it's universal, if it's rooted in human rights norms, and that to be universal is also about being sustainable economically, being sustainable socially, and being sustainable environmentally. It's also important to stress the principles of universality, indivisibility, interdependence, and interrelated nature of all human rights. Again, I'm emphasizing this because we are speaking in the context of Vienna 20 years later. And also that the idea that the human right to development must also mean a full realization of the right of people to self-determination. I'll highlight just four main points. The first one is that the human rights, equality, and non-discrimination principles have to underpin the development agenda. I think other people may have said this. Um, but it is also important to realize that already we have these norms. They're already very clear frameworks. So if you think in terms of uh, international, regional human rights instruments, uh, if you think in terms of, in some countries, national legislation that's very strong, already you have norms that you can work with. So there's no reason why the post-2015 development uh, framework needs to reinvent the wheel in that sense. Uh, we have to push for full implementation of human rights instruments. So, you know, as opposed to starting anew, we should re-examine and we should reflect on perhaps why we haven't implemented uh, human rights instruments. Um, I think someone else mentioned it already. Um, since the General Assembly that had a special event on the MDGs has just ended, uh, it will be important to highlight some of what that outcome document uh, says. Uh, because again, as campaigners and as activists, um, sometimes we want to give a lot more meaning to words and to hold 
words to account. So if things are put down in writing, then perhaps it's our task to try and push them to the level of action and implementation. <coughs> so that outcome document uh, talks about a commitment to poverty eradication and sustainable development. It talks about a coherent and integrated approach to sustainable development. It mentions a universal set of goals whilst being conscious of uh, differing national circumstances and that we need to respect national policies that we need to reflect uh, and respect national priorities. I'll come back to that point later because the point around national policy autonomy is really critical. But this I am, I am quoting from that outcome document. It talks about the promotion of democratic governance, the rule of law, peace and security, gender equality and human rights for all. Those are not my words. These are coming from this outcome document, uh, the meeting that just ended. And I just raise it to mention that the fact that we want human rights, non-discrimination principles to underpin the development agenda is not in vain. I think it makes a big difference to start from the premise that you will work from the basis that human rights are for all and they're universal and we need to implement them. The second point that I wanted to talk about is that we have an imperative to redress the structural hindrances to real developmental progress. I think this might uh, echo a lot of what was said in the panel previously, uh, before the break and before our panel. And some of those hindrances include um, the sorts of macroeconomic policies that induce inequalities. And I think that's a fact that most of us um, would agree with. Uh, also the fact that we have certain orthodoxies which will limit the role of the state to deliver essential services and its core duties and responsibilities. I think a lot of the analysis around, uh, like for this country and uh, most of Europe, uh, the financial crisis is really at the heart of that uh, analysis and reflection is what is the role of the state um, as we know it. And for those of us who come from Africa and other developing countries, this has been our reality for a really, really long time from the times of structure adjustment programs and rolling back of the state and actually undermining uh, the ability of the state to deliver on its core duties and obligations. So since we are talking about the human rights framework, um, it's also to emphasize the fact that as a duty barrier, as uh, states have the paramount responsibility for the right to development, to the extent that we undermine their ability and their legitimacy through economic policies that are not helpful, you know, we have to address this and we have to view this as uh, very crucial uh, hindrances. And these include I think there was mention of fiscal austerity before. Um, the fact that states uh, have a very diminished, if any, uh, regulatory capacity. The fact that tax policies are very inequitable. The fact that uh, the space to autonomously define uh, policies, uh, so states have a very limited flexibility in that sense. These are important issues to look at. And as long as we don't address them, uh, they will undermine uh, development. So in the case of Africa, uh, when we think about uh, some of the structural hindrances, we need to transform our economies. So there's a lot of discussion right now uh, about transforming our economies to move away from primary extraction, from just doing you know, low value add agriculture and services, to talk more about production, to talk more about you know, better diversified economies, and to talk about greater justice um, in terms of the management of our natural, natural resource wealth. Um, we are insisting that we have to curb illicit uh, financial flows, the wealth that leaves the continent. I mean, listening to Noma, I could relate a lot to, to what she was describing about Guatemala. So we need to plug those leaks um, because we're not going to develop. Where are we going to get the resources to develop if so much leaves uh, the continent? Um, but that we also have to talk about sustainable, and sustainability in this sense also is about equity. Economic growth has to be sustainable, but also equitable. Um, to do all of this, we have to strengthen the capability of the state to deliver these essential services to citizens, to address inequalities, and so on and so forth. So in Africa, there's a lot of talk about developmental capable states, and it's deliberate that we're saying that because development has to be also the business of states. Uh, we cannot have the scenarios when we had restructure adjustment programs where then you have NGOs, you're saying charitable organizations and others will step in and try and 
fail for the missing gap. It's not possible. We have to have the states being capable and feeling that this is their core responsibility and that they can deliver. The third thing that I wanted to talk about, and sorry if this sound a bit disjointed, I feel like I'm just signposting, um, is that we need workable accountability and financing strategies. These have to be built into this post-2015 development framework. Why is that important? We have to transform state-citizen relationships, and taxation is at the heart of this discussion. Um, and, and, and why this matters is because you then enhance accountability. Um, it means that you can get better economic governance. You can have better accountability for the use of public resources. You can have a more participative democracy. So all of these things, we need to unpack them and we need to push for this in the context of the discussions around the post-2015 development framework. We need a paradigm shift in terms of international partnerships. We have to move away from dependency. We have to talk more about mutual collaboration. And we have to have partnerships that are guided by the principles of equality of nations and peoples. You know, we cannot have what we have had before. That's not going to do it. Um, we need to align financing strategies with human rights principles, climate justice goals. So within the context of the post-2015 development framework, there's now, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll signpost this at the end, there are going to be discussions around financing strategies. And in those discussions, this is why we're saying we need to insist that they're underpinned by human rights principles and these principles about climate justice. We have to build in a monitoring mechanism. And I think that uh, human rights movements, people's movements, citizens' organizations will have workable ideas about what monitoring arrangements will work. I think we can draw from human rights frameworks. Uh, five minutes is a lot. <laughs> we can draw from uh, human rights frameworks in terms of monitoring mechanisms and those can be how those can be effective. I think we had before about shadow reporting, but also holding national governments to account to instruments that they've signed up to. I think the post-2015 framework can draw from this examples and experience. Um, but we need to have a very robust analysis of the financing needs. This has to happen in a very transparent manner, an inclusive manner. So we need to understand how much will it take to cover this agenda that we will agree, if it's a universal agenda. Um, to that extent, for instance, um, and also from a lot of the work that we're doing in Africa, we're insisting that we have to enhance domestic resource mobilization. So as we're talking about transforming our economies, as we're talking about capable democratic developmental states, we're saying that there's a role for taxation and that tax policy is a very robust instrument that can be used to unleash resources for equitable development. We want to interrogate and ensure that this happens. Um, we need to re-examine the global distribution of taxing rights. And here is where we need to tackle tax avoidance and again illicit capital flight, I mentioned this before. Um, the idea that we have tax havens, that there's secrecy jurisdictions and so on and so forth, we need to address this. Um, Figures about the money that uh, leaves the continent are uh, mind-boggling. Um, um, estimates from uh, the Glo Global Financial Integrity talks about up to uh, 1.8 trillion US dollars in the period up to 2009. Those are still seen as quite conservative estimates about the monies that leave uh, the continent of Africa. Um, we need uh, finally, as the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about is that we need a global economic and political environment that's conducive to stability, to justice, to equity, to mutual accountability as a basis for these new forms of partnerships. I think the post-2015 development framework is really about um, a sense of partnership, but that we need an environment um, that can allow this different um, meaning of partnership. But we have so many hindrances. I think that we've talked about um, the war on terror, in my view, is a big problem. And, and people who are working on human rights know how it is a problem. Um, the rise in militancy and conquest, you know, it's, it's a big problem for, for any of these things to happen. Um, the impacts of the global financial crisis are real, um, sitting in this country, and I can imagine that uh, this, this resonates. The fact that um, dogmatic neoliberal economic policies persist is a problem. So before we can have 
this new understanding before we can have any meaningful or any shifts in the kind of partnerships that we're talking about, then we need to face head on uh, some of these hindrances. Just as I end uh, with the one minute, I will signpost some of the key post-2015 processes that are again coming from it, from the point of view that we can wield influence. Between now and uh, September 2014, we have the work of the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. And again, this is building on, on the work of the Rio Conference, Rio Plus 20, and so on and so forth. We need to engage these processes, even as they're moving into the intergovernmental phase. I mean, who make up the governments? We elect governments. And as citizens, we need to remember that we still should hold our governments to account. So that even when these intergovernmental processes are happening, we still reserve the right and must engage these processes to be accountable to the things that we desire, that the things that we need to see uh, happen through. So there's that. There's the work of the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Financing. So financing is going to be a big, a big discussion. And then there's a process to develop options for technology facilitation mechanism. Um, the actual intergovernmental negotiations will only be launched um, after September 2014. And the target is to, by September 2015, adopt uh, the agenda, which means essentially uh, we have a full year plus. And I feel that there's time to actually make a difference. We need to engage national governments. We need to influence the outcomes. I feel that it is up to citizens, and it's up to citizens' organizations to make a difference by calling on governments to be accountable. They're not a law unto themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have time for questions, comments, and some discussion. If you please try to have your questions as punctual as possible, that would be appreciated. Maybe we can take a few initially, uh, maybe four to five comments, depending on how much we find, and turn to the, our colleagues. Um, I had a question for Norma Maldonado. Um, yeah, it's on. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Hello? Hi. Hello? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I had a question for Norm Norma Maldonado, and um, I was really interested while hearing your um, struggles in Guatemala and um, the resource struggles of other nations um, trying to develop nations trying to steal and people um, coercing Guatemala to becoming developed. developed. Um, how has the government, um, government, uh, perception of you as a terrorist uh, affected uh, your ability to help do your job and um, create this justice that you're trying to look for for the Guatemalan people. Thank you. We have another question. Come. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to be as on point as possible, but my question is directed to Ms. Erica. I think that's how you say it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but feel free for any of the other panelists if they want to chime in in an answer. Mm -hmm. So you have, you talked about meaningful economic determination, and I see how that makes sense in a country such as Libya that didn't have a lot of infrastructure before prior to the, um, you know, the Arab Spring. And there was an article in The Economist that just came out today that talked about how it's really open to investment and small businesses. However, I don't understand how 
people here in the United States or, in or even in Egypt itself can see that economic determination when the military has always had such a strong hand within economic investments and how those private sectors work as well as the economy. So I guess my question is, is how can we as students within the United States or even those in Egypt instill that kind of economic determination in the people with Egypt when the government has such a stronghold on these um, economic policies? Whereas in countries such as Libya, where everything was basically, it started over again, it's much easier to see that kind of uh, philosophy. Hmm. Anyone else? No? Well, I have, a bef before turning it to, to them then, I'd like to have put a question for Atieno and, and Domo. And, um, because you refer to sustainability several times. So I was just wondering, um, because it seems to me in a way that, de that development is a sort of suggests a kind of a paradigm that is linked, I see linked with modernization, which was linked with ideas of civilization vis-a-vis -vis, you know, barbarism or primitivism. So it sort of had that genealogy, I think, and sustainability um, sort of suggests a different paradigm, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you are sort of bringing both together, and I wonder if you are doing this uh, intentionally, if you are, um, if for you these in fact seem, you know, are two, um, you don't see them as different at all, or you see them as different, but you see an important uh, to bring them together, at least for the strategic reasons, because they point to different things, right? One is to have, uh, when you talk about sustainability, one doesn't necessarily talk about, um, I mean, the question of developed or underdeveloped, I mean, it, it suggests another sort of social relations and economic relations. Mm -hmm. Just wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, and also about these, how to make these governments accountable, mm -hmm. because it seems that at the end of the day, you were alluding to the need for political mobilization of the citizens and different forms of, of mobilization. And it struck me that that was at the heart of the three presentations in a way. Mm -hmm. And that sort of call for also um, self-determination was so important mm -hmm. in your presentations and, and sort of a recognition of the need for political activism. And so I was wondering whether it would also be good to think about this kind of encounter as sharing political strategies from different sites, mm -hmm. right? In addition of different ways of engaging the discourse of human rights. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I, I'm late. <laughs> uh, Norma, I have a question for you. One of the things that was in the Vienna Declaration was the right to self-determination, uh, the importance of indigenous people. And, and I know you didn't have enough time to cover all of this, but one of the things that I would like you to speak to is coming from the perspective of indigenous people and their rights, what would you want the post-2015 agenda mm -hmm. to deal with in terms of the rights of indigenous people? Like, what, what is it? I mean, are there things that we should all be advocating for uh, other than sort of the end of capitalism and all of the, the, the usual ones. But, you know, something specific in terms of goals that we want to advocate for, particular conventions you want, you know, what is it that you would think that this post-2015 agenda needs to deal with in terms of the right to self-determination and the rights of indigenous people? Thank you. Maybe we can go in the order that you presented, beginning with Norma. Good. Um, First of all, I think uh, for, um, I don't know your name, but thank you. Um, the government, uh, maybe, maybe make it clear. Guatemala is like a large plantation, like a finca. So like 20 families, for example, I don't know how many families in the United States run the business, but back home it's small. So it's like 200 families, very powerful. And so they used to have the military as guardian, but the military became so strong, powerful, economically too, now they're competitors. They compete. So they're competing their territory as well, the, the military. So the military 
have their own best interest in, in the country. And they're usually on, on land, pieces of land for drug dealing. For, so anybody who intercept or to, to obstacle anything that has to do with their business, then it's, it's, it's label or logo the, uh, the terrorists, the people who, are, who don't want uh, development, the, the people who are um, hysterical, uh, how you call the environmentalists. Or, but not only that, they're putting like a stage of siege in areas, a, a state of exception, which means no constitutional rights in entire areas when there is, uh, a, when there is um, mobilization. It means you have no guarantees. It's like you have a, a curfew. You can leave the house. You cannot gather in groups. Uh, uh, like you cannot have a reunion meetings. When, um, there are people that uh, fight fight against companies. It's happening right now in one of the states in Huehuetenango. There's a stage of, they want the stage of siege because it's total uprising of the communities. So like uprising causes the government to take away constitutional rights? Exactly. So they can go in and take you away and you don't have any rights and you don't have due process or any kind. Uh, or they can, anybody could easily just shot you and say, well, it was, she was on drug dealing or whatever. So uh, essentially they're manipulating uh, you and saying that what you're doing and saying lying? Is that what you're doing? So, so we, we have to be very careful of, of how we do this. And we have very good uh, uh, human rights organizations with us, a company groups. But now even the government is saying that any foreigner like peace brigades who are going with us, are protecting us physically. They're going to be sent out of the country. That was the, yesterday. Hmm. So and let's say you go to take care of me. Then you cannot march with me or go anywhere because you could go put in back into a plane to your own country. The peace brigades, you know, like you that go and accompany human rights activists, they are threatened now. That was yesterday and day before. They're going to be sent out. So that means we are like, you know, we have to not say anything. So companies can come and break the, con the entire territory, take the water, take everything. They have the rights because the Constitution protects the trade agreements. They have the legal. They can find the country for not uh, observing invest investment. You know, there are chapters on this. They can be put in CIADI and different uh, WTO and find countries for not complying. But so meaning we are on the way of business. So people, so they want the country with no people. And so, so what are the, the what are the, the people are going to do? Going where? When you're building a wall in the United States so nobody can come here Cities, we're not industrial country, we're agriculture country, we're attached to soil, to land. This is our nature. Mother nature is sacred. It's, it has another relationship. It's not about items or business. So, so it's a very desperate for entire communities. I don't want to uh, individualize this. It's not about me. It's communities threaten the life of, of, of communities, of people, entire groups. So I just put that an example that when we have opposed the trade agreements, they have went and raided our homes, took computers, took information, took everything as a way of terrorizing. So the state is the terrorist. The state terrorized its own people. So it's a very different concept. Maybe you don't have it here. Although you have all this hearing, you know, they have all these, you, they're observing what you read or whatever. You know, I know, I read that, uh, you know, they know even the underwear that we have for the day, or I don't know, they, they know everything from the, from the conversations we have on the phone or email or, so anyways. Um, the other thing about self-determination and, and, and the 2020, if they were binding 
obligations. We are in a declaration of Medellin where civil society gathered because there was a, a business and human rights in Medellin res recently. What we are asking is a court to judge, a criminal court to judge companies. So binding rules, obligations to this. But now it's like whatever they decide, social responsibility, the, the business are just, you know, laid back. So if, if you're asking me what perspectives in this 2015, 2015, we want binding rules for companies, obligations, responsibility, not symbolically written like they have, I love. So thank you. So I guess that's um, the question for me was about whether my comment about uh, economic uh, democratic particip or democratic participation in the economy would hold in Egypt as it would in another context. So let me start by, I guess, addressing the assumption, which is that in a country where the state is not central and not undemocratically led, that this makes sense. And in another state where the, the central government is the problem, you can't do that. Um, so two things. In most contexts, the state owns uh, the nation's resources, and that's certainly true in throughout the Middle East, and it was no less true in Libya than it is in Egypt, despite the fact that most natural resources have been privatized in Egypt actually more than they were privatized in Libya. The major distinction, I think, is about when we think of the eastern province of Libya, which was much, <coughs> much less developed than the rest of the country, and that was mostly because of internecine conflict that involved Muammar Gaddafi himself. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is that the problem with moving from um, a, a centrally controlled economy, as is the case, again, throughout the Arab world, whether they be in monarchies or republics, is that that transition is not happening in a way that is loosening the grip of government. Instead, it's happening in a way where those um, suddenly the, the public wealth that's benefiting public servants is now becoming, is now going to private hands where those public servants have private entities as well. Does that make sense? So that the government, you know, these political elites obviously have private enterprises and their crony capitalist counterparts who are benefiting from them, be they their siblings, their cousins, or their uh, immediate network. And so that transition was not happening in a way where uh, government, the government grip has been loosened in a way that suddenly was immediately democratic and open to a nation, but just shifted into a private, into private hands, into privatized hands. The third is about Egypt specifically and the role of the military. The military has always had a close relationship to all ruling uh, governments, especially since the 1952 coup. And so even though the Muslim Brotherhood, which was the first democratically elected government in Egypt last year, was brought to power, the Muslim Brotherhood maintained its relationships to the military. And in the constitution, its very controversial constitution that it rammed through and onto um, uh, uh, its population, it retained the privileges, the economic privileges of the military within that constitution. Um, and what they had jurisdiction over. So th this isn't an issue about military governance. To the contrary, the military in many ways um, was seen as representing a deep state um, almost comparable to the way it does in Turkey. And so that this transition and even a democratic government didn't work to complicate uh, that relationship. And so then what, right? Then what, if this is the situation? The problem is that these are centralized governments the way to deal with those with those authoritarian regimes who are obviously benefiting themselves without equitable, equitable distribution is not to democratize the economy as an answer. Because then you have the worst of both worlds. You have no democratic representation. You have an absolutely dismal economy and a growing gap between rich and poor. And so, but 
the response to that has to be with us reevaluating, frankly, our Middle East foreign policy in toto. Right? Eso. Exactamente. So, I mean, our Middle East foreign policy, Egypt is the second largest recipient of U.S. aid only after Israel. And the reason it receives that aid is because of its treaty with Israel. It's 1979 Camp David Treaty. And so that's the primary reason. That's what we're trying to uphold. That's the same reason, that same logic, is the reason that we protect Saudi Arabia and we've been protecting Bahrain and we protect Kuwait, mm. um, but we have been very, very fiercely uh, reproaching against Iran and Syria, obviously, and this access of, of resistance in the Middle East. And so our economic policies abroad and what we're concerned with about development mm -hmm. is intertwined with we as the United States want to maintain a lack of democratic participation. Because if, the Arab, if Arab people were allowed to rule themselves, the Middle East would look much, much different. And the first thing that would look different is obviously the situation of, of, of Palestine and Israel. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. No, you didn't. That's exactly right. U.S. aid is a problem, and it's conditioned. Egypt's re re receipt of that aid is conditioned on its compliance with U.S. policy in the Middle East. That's why Egypt actually didn't immediately lift the siege on its border with Rafah and Gaza, but maintained it even after the uh, revolution. Thank you. I think there was, there was just one question to me from the moderator, which I think also flows from the initial questions you posed to the panel before we started, is that I think sometimes it's important to also uh, debunk terminologies. So most of us now use the term development very liberally, uh, yet it doesn't mean the same thing. There are very many different interpretations. So the last interpretation I would use for development is the one around modernization, because I think this is the most problematic one of them all. Um, and so anywhere where I use the term development, for me, it's a much more profound, perhaps for lack of a better word, and I think that even universally, perhaps, we haven't come up, come up with that word. Um, so you need to contrast. Every time I was talking about sustainability, I think that's really at the heart of the transformation agenda that I was describing, which is a lot about equity. It's about putting people at the heart of development, about being environmentally conscious all the things that perhaps development as we know it today doesn't represent. There isn't a template. I think this is the point that we are belaboring, that we need to craft this vision about better lives, about lives of dignity. And perhaps human rights norms maybe get closest to getting us to that vision of what it is in terms of outcomes that we seek. Um, I think that... Um, so yeah, I think we need to unpack these terminologies. I think perhaps your reminder to us is that when we keep doing this, um, then perhaps we are speaking at cross purposes. So I hope I didn't entirely in my presentation sound like it was mixed up. Um, in terms of uh, political activism, I couldn't uh, say that any more than I did already. I think that for me, it's all about citizens' agency. Mm -hmm. And the day that I feel that I am helpless and there's nothing that I can do that will make a difference is the day that I should stop breathing. So I think that as long as we are alive and we're breathing, we make a difference. Even if we are screaming in a room full of noise, we are making a point. And I think that the more we can find ourselves and we can find each other, it makes a big difference. So for me, part of the frustration right now is feeling as though all the people who have these good ideas about the alternatives are not finding each other enough in a way that can make this difference. But every day we're making a difference. I mean, listening to Norma, listening to everyone, listening to the entire discussions the whole day, you feel energized and to know that we are all making a difference and we have to persist and we have to continue. So that's definitely the way to go. Thank you. And that's a lovely end to this panel. Thank you. <laughs>